This is Dr. Paul. I, the gentleman I thank is the, recognized uh, for two minutes. Gentleman for yielding, and I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, I rise in opposition to this resolution, uh, not because uh, I am taking sides and, and picking who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, but I'm looking at this more from the angle of being a uh, United States citizen and American, and I think resolutions like this uh, really do us great harm. Uh, in many ways, what's happening in the Middle East, and in particular with Gaza right now, we have some moral responsibility for both sides, uh, in, in a way, because we provide help and funding uh, for both Arab nations and Israel. And uh, so we definitely have a moral responsibility, and especially now, today, the weapons being used to uh, kill so many Palestinians are American weapons, and uh, American funds essentially are being used uh, for this. But there's a political liability, which I think is something that we fail to look at because too often there's so much blowback from our intervention in areas that we shouldn't be involved in. You know, Hamas, if you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. And you say, well, yeah, that was better then and served its purpose, but we didn't want Hamas to do this. So then we as Americans say, well, we have such a good system, we're going to impose this on the world. We're going to invade Iraq and teach people how to be Democrats. We want free elections. So we encourage the Palestinians to have a free election. They do, and they elect Hamas. So we first indirectly and directly through Israel help establish Hamas. Then we have an election. Then Hamas becomes dominant, so we have to kill them. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. During, during the 80s, uh, you know, we were allied with Osama bin Laden and uh, we were con contending with the Soviets. It was at that time our CAA thought it was good if we radicalized the Muslim world. So we financed the madrasa schools to radicalize the Muslims in order to compete with the, with the Soviets. There's too much blowback. There's a lot of reasons why we should oppose this resolution. It is not in the interest of the United States. It's not in the interest of Israel either. I got lucky, like, again, that's kind of a, I keep getting lucky. <laughs> My warrant was definitely a, um, like an ASO guy, like loved the source operation stuff. Um, and so he hooked myself and my echo up with this program with fifth group and fifth group and 10th group were based around it, but it was a red cell against the NCCC, nuclear command and control. Do you want to explain red cell to the audience? Or yeah, what? yeah. So red cell is basically like where, like in this case, we play the bad guys. And we were trying to infiltrate and interdict, you know, national assets. And this, that type of program is is all over the place, you know. And it's typically, they'll, they'll use special operations. I know SEALs have played this uh, in this same um, program. And basically we had to play the role of terrorists or and or like Russian infiltrators. And the goal was to cause a couple of second hiccup in our nuclear defense. And that was all it would take for Russia to win, a few seconds. So it was a pretty amazing thing, a uh, pretty amazing program, eye-opening. It got me a TS clearance as an E6 baby SF guy. And that was huge. Back then, TS clearances were team sergeants and team leaders only. Nowadays, more guys on the team, seniors will have them, and et cetera, et cetera. But back then, E6 with a TS clearance, that was, that was a big deal. Yeah. And, uh, and it was like six months uh, that we were – following, surveilling, chasing these assets. And it, it was worldwide. And I didn't even know this till we were done. For six months, I didn't see any of my teammates. I didn't know them. They were from uh, only, only dead drops, only a few text messages, but mostly communicating through dead drops. Old school tradecraft, 
old school training ground. So the first month was like a school uh, put on by ASO guys at fifth group to get us tuned up and ready for it. I had no idea about tradecraft, right? Uh, so it was eye-opening. And the reason I think that, you know, they liked me and, and, and they, you know, I didn't look like an SF guy. I was still a skinny little runner kid, you know? And I was so young that I, there was no one have ever, would have ever pegged me as an SF guy back then. And, um, you know, of course, it was a project team, so we you know, relaxed grooming standards and all that so we could, you know, I just went back to playing a part I always knew, you know, bought some cheap camouflage from uh, Walmart, went back to being a redneck, you know, and my cover was solidified. But I'm talking about chasing these assets all over the country. Um, there were days where I thought I would, like, got compromised by their security guys, and I would just leave the rental car, freaking call the rental company, hey, the car broke down, and I'd go get another one, two or three rental cars a day. And, I mean doing things to gain access to military bases that, you know, no ID card. We had to get out of jail free car when we got arrested or rolled up by MPs or something. Uh, but it was an amazing program. Eye opening. I had no idea how the nuclear command and control worked. And it was eye opening and all the different assets and planes and planes and trucks and things uh, in this hierarchy that if our, we did go to nuclear war with Russia, how it worked. And even still, it was very compartmentalized. So what I learned was only a portion of the big picture. But it was amazing. Like I said, didn't know my teammates. I finally met them on the morning of 9-11. We were playing Red Cell against national assets the day we were attacked. Shit. So even more funny, it was also the day we were supposed to interdict. So wow. my target was an Air Force general. All I had to do was take a picture of him inside of 400 meters, and it would have counted as a sniper shot. And I had followed him. I had actually lost them, and I was, oh, my God. I was the only one on my team that had followed him out of, like, Missouri into Nebraska. What is it? Off at Air Force Base. Followed them, lost them there, and I just kind of camped out. I got a hotel room and, you know, pretty much just stayed up for three days watching the gate. And all of a sudden, the convoy left. And I was like, sweet, got them. <laughs> and another time I lost them and in the middle of nowhere flatlands like Nebraska or Oklahoma. And I was just like sitting on top of a, like an off ramp so I could see for miles. And I was just sitting there. I was like, man, damn it. I'm going to have to let them know I lost them. And I went, Dude, like 50 miles away, I see this truck convoy in the middle of the night. And these aren't like black trucks. These are regular trucks, you know, any, but I could see them. And I was like, looked at my map because there was no Google Maps. Get my maps out and I start looking and I'm like, National Guard base. On the road they're on. I just went and waited. And so we got the orders that, hey, we're going to interdict um, on Saturday morning. Or whatever, I don't remember, Saturday, 9 11. And uh, I was like, okay, well, how am I going to get close to this dude? I crawled <laughs> on my belly through the concrete little drainage ditch thingy, like all night long, trying to be all, you know, sniper crawl on your belly. And sure enough, man, the sun comes up. I'm watching. I get a glimpse of the general as he moved from where he was staying to the, their little command post or whatever. And all of a sudden, man, like everything started changing. Like, they got busy. And I'm like, what's going on? And I get a my little flip phone vibrates, and it was like, um, abort, 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 move to such and such, motel, IBO, whatever. I text back, I am not compromised. I'm good to go. Text message said, I say again, abort immediately do nothing else but come to this place do not make me like the the warrant that was in charge it was him and he was like do not make me tell you anything else again i'm, like, I'm thinking i'm fucked up you know i'm like what did i do like i didn't do anything wrong they don't know i'm here but as i'm watching them in the marines they had like a i don't know maybe two or three squad detachment of marines and all of a sudden they got magazines in their m16s 
the Raven um, Air Force security guys, they're doing patrols now. Shit. And I'm in the freaking grass, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know, freaking wearing real tree camouflage and pair oh. of jeans from Walmart. Like, I'm not gillied out, nothing like that, dude. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not even taking it that serious. I got to get out of jail free card. No, dude, they got live ammo in their shit now because 9-11 had just happened. And you don't even realize. I had no clue. So what took me like five hours of crawling took me only about an hour. I was all scuffed up from crawling on that little concrete and stuff and get out and go get in the rental car and haul ass back. And, dude, I, there's this, like, little roadside, little 1960s, 50s, one-story motel, you know. And there's, like, 40 rental cars in the parking lot. What in the hell? There's the chief. He's like the program manager or whatever. He's like, come on. Roger that. Get in there, dude. And this hotel room is packed full of people. Clearly some are operators. There's females. There's like, what in the hell is all this? Dude, talking about compartmentalization. I had been working with a four-person cell for six months and never met them. Unbeknownst to me, this entire 30-some people had been on that target the whole time. Wow. So we want to talk about redundancy. It's amazing. What a, what a, a, a cool program. Learned a lot, like I said, and the, you know, they're on the TVs, the towers, man. And it's like, and they're like, yeah, man, we're under attack. And I'm just like, <gasps> the Marines would have killed me. <laughs> yeah. Or at a minimum beat my ass really well. Yeah. You know, who knows what jail I'd have been put in until they finally found my call colonel such and such. So it was pretty spooky, man. Kind yeah. of a cool story how 9-11 happened. And it was like, okay, what do we do now? Flights are canceled. We've got unit guys that need to get to Brad. We've got 10th group guys that need to get to Colorado. 5th group guys to get back here. What are we doing? Some people get in their cars and start headed to Bragg. Um, the asset. Right, clearly they all made contact and said, "Hey, we're the people who have been on you. Um, we're all still here and available to help if you need it." And the colonel basically said, "Hey, we are en route to, um, you know, the Cheyenne facility in Colorado. Could you escort us?" And we we're like, "Yep." So we all, or most of us, went to um, Colorado, and then they C-17s came and got us, took us all back to wherever we needed to go, and. Um, so I'm back at Campbell with the fifth group guys, and they're like, what do you want to do? I'm like, what do you mean? What you've just heard there is a gentleman by the name of Tony Calden talking to um, <coughs> Sean Ryan of the Sean Ryan podcast. He's an ex-Green Beret, um, ex-Spec Ops SEAL, and um, ex-Red Cell. Now, the Red Cell units are um, specially trained spec ops soldiers and um, they're originally primarily um, made up of SEAL Team 6 also they were also set up by SEAL Team 6's founder um, Dick Marchinko their <coughs> primary purpose was to test um, army bases around the world for any weaknesses that a terrorist could take over. So they were trained to think and act like a terrorist. <clears throat> In many ways, they are very similar or a, a similar idea to Gladio, Operation Gladio. Now, lots of people have done far better videos than I'm going to a year. Um, so I won't go too much into Gladio, but basically Gladio was set up after World War II. Um, <clears throat> by MI6 and the CIA and then continued by NATO um, and they basically funded fa Nazi, um, Nazi and fascist factions within initially Italy but then all the way around Europe and then all the way around the world um, and there were sleeper cells to be activated whenever the intelligence agencies needed them and they were mostly made up of, of local resistance militia, ex-resistance militia, or um, the Mafia in a lot of cases. Um, the Mafia supplied them with the weapons that were supplied by the US and UK military. And <clears throat> their 
orders and whatnot were given to them by the Vatican. <laughs> now, all this didn't come out until 1979 when the P2 movement, the P2 organisation was um, exposed in Italy. Um, they were exposed after they killed three, three journalists and a politician um, because the Italian government was becoming less friendly to America and wanted to be more friendly to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to be under the uh, under the Americans' wing, so to speak, and of course America didn't like that and activated P two, and then they got arrested and all this came out. <clears throat> what you saw at the beginning of this video was about the DX plot, which is a continuation of Gladio. This was the first time that a red cell had been captured, caught in the act. Um, they were carrying fake Serbian passports that were going to be left after the bombing that they conducted. Um, and this was, if it had gone through, if it had gone ahead, was going to be Europe's 9-11, basically in Germany. Fortunately, they were captured. But it did open up a whole can of worms. Because then people started to find out about what else America had been funding. How many other terrorist organisations they were involved with. Of course, everyone knows about the Mujahideen in, uh, in Afghanistan, um, who then became Al-Qaeda after they served their purpose, so to speak, against the Russians. They supposedly became a terrorist organisation. They weren't actually, they are, they are in fact mercenaries for, for the American government. Um, Hamas is another example. You saw Ron Paul there talking about um, the Brit basically Britain and the Britain and the US and funding Hamas through Israel, which is true. That's what happens. The same thing happened with the IRA in in, uh, in Ireland. So yeah, <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about with the IRA, <laughs> the IRA. 90% of their upper echelon were MI6. It was discovered not so long back. The same could be said for Hamas. It can guarantee that the upper echelons are primarily intelligence, British and US intelligence, dishing out the funding. The same thing can be said for Hezbollah. They're another one that was set up by the, by the US and the UK. Um, <clears throat> the the uh, PKK in um, in northern Syria, <clears throat> all of which have a living leadership and are in reality classed as a terrorist organisation, or you could class them as. ISIS is different. ISIS was the products of the Pentagon, which is one of those papers that you saw there. That was the brainchild or the brainstorming session, as it was to set up ISIS as a fictional organisation. Yes, there are men involved in it, but the leadership doesn't exist. It never has. So this brings us on to false flags. And false flags. I don't think there's been any terrorist um, action lately that has been done by anyone other than a spec up red team with mercenaries on side, if needs be, like October the 7th this year. Why it took the IDF six hours to get to the most secure border in the world that was beaten by paragliders. See how it doesn't make sense. Right when BB is um, losing popularity. It's back, backfiring though, isn't it? Silly. Nowadays, red team units are most used by um, military psyops teams and online warfare teams, which brings us nicely into Now these guys are fun. Everyone knows about the 77th Brigade. What about the 13 Signals? Yeah, in the UK. 
No? East Squadron? No one had East Squadron. No. Um, what about Golem? No. No. GCHQ's 77th Brigade unit, basically. No. No. <clears throat> this document here, J Trick document, is the. Um, I've shown it before a lot. But this is the. Precursor to the 77th Brigade, but also the handbook for both 77th and for Golan. These are also linked to the psychological warfare wings of the army, yeah, which are um, the Nudge Unit and Spy B. Everyone's heard about them. In America, they have their own counterparts, they have their own versions, um, which are Prism, uh, that. Um, Edward Snowden exposed, and also Pegasus, um, the 4th Airborne Psychological Warfare Group, Psychological Warfare Research Group, sorry, <laughs> Psychological Research Group, and many, many, many others around the world. These are all pri used primarily to recruit jihadists, and recruit terrorists, or people that could be used as terrorists. They are not, <laughs> they are not for um, terrorist prevention or sometimes they are, right? Just to justify their, their, their excuse for being around, but primarily they're used for creating terrorist cells to blame on false things. <clears throat> so yeah, and these guys are fantastic at what they do. They are. I'll, I'll, I'll give them the due. They really are. Especially the Brits. Yeah? Those Brits. The 77th Brigade are world renowned. No, they really are. And they're used all over the place. They're pretty much a mercenary unit at this stage. Which is illegal. Believe it or not. <laughs> but there we are. <coughs> Now, I've gone. Over, we're going to go over these properly in the later episodes. Same with Red Cell, the Red Cell units. I'm just giving a brief overview here. So we'll skip ahead now, and we'll look at these guys, which is mainstream media. Now this is where it gets fun because the the MSM and these psychological units have been hand in hand for a long while especially in the UK they run through organisations like Bellingcat um, the um, Trusted News Initiative um, the uh, BBC Global News Fund the uh, Google Global News Initiative you name it now They've all pretty much agreed to, to do as these psychological warfare wings ask, yeah? Or suggest, shall I say. They give them suggestions, they don't ask them. They don't ask them, they just point them in some direction. <clears throat> but this has birthed some very strange and unique, shall we say, ways of approaching the media and the dissemination of information. I did, I did a video a while back, also on the 77th Brigade, using um, the visual equivalency as an example of their media manipulation. Again, this is another topic that we'll look into quite deeply. The documents that you can see on screen now behind you will also be giving you an idea of how deep this rabbit hole goes. And boy, does it go deep. They're also tied very much in with the government, all media, all media. And this applies to social media as well, which we will get to at some point. <clears throat> Basically, the psychological, all of these, all of these separate entities all work together, yeah, to achieve a common goal, 
which is the subjugation and control over us and our way of life. All of them. And this is on a global scale. It's not just on a little sort of minute scale. It's on a global scale. So yeah, all of these entities essentially work together using all sorts of varying techniques all to steer us in the direction that the actual, not really government, but the people behind the governments want us to go. And so far it's been working pretty well. There are other ways as well of manipulating us. And the gentleman that I'm going to show you last will tell you about that. And this shocked me. This is how Google controls it. Precisely, yeah. because that's when we started monitoring. That's when we, mm -hmm. we invented the, the world's first system for surveilling them doing to them what they do to us and our kids we learned how to to capture what they call ephemeral content mm -hmm. let me explain here this is a very important concept 2018 there was a leak of emails from google to the wall street journal and in that conversation that these googlers were having they said how can we use ephemeral experiences to change people's views about trump's travel ban well, my head practically exploded when I saw that because we had been studying in controlled experiments since 2013 the power that ephemeral experiences have to change people's opinions and attitudes and beliefs and purchases and votes. Well, what's an ephemeral experience? Okay, most of the experiences you have online are ephemeral. And ephemeral means fleeting, means you have the experience and then whatever was there, the content disappears like in a puff of smoke and it disappears. So for example, you go to Google search engine, which you should never use, by the way, I can explain why, but, uh, and you type in a, a search term, you start to type, they're flashing search suggestions at you. Those are ephemeral, they disappear, they're not stored anywhere, you can't go back in time. Search results populate below. Those are ephemeral. You can't go back in time and see what search results there. How about answer boxes, news feeds? Uh, when you're on YouTube, you know those, the, the recommended one that's going to come up next, the up next video? That's it's not a, tracked. It's not tracked. That's yeah. ephemeral. The whole list of recommended videos, it's all ephemeral. What we started doing in 2016 with a very small system at the time was preserving that and analyzing that. We found, on, uh, we were looking at, at Google, Bing, and Yahoo, we found uh, pro-Hillary Clinton bias in all 10 search positions on the first page of Google search results, but not Bing or Yahoo. That's very important Interesting. for control. So you're saying we should use Bing? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> but the point is that, uh, that if that level of bias because that's what our experiments look at they look at how bias can shift opinions and votes we measure that very precisely if that level of bias that we measure that we capture that we preserve normally that's never preserved had been had been present nationwide in the 2016 election uh well that would have shifted between two point six and 10.4 million votes to Hillary Clinton with no one knowing that that had occurred because people can't see bias yeah. in search results. They just click on what's highest. They trust whatever that takes them to, if they're undecided. These companies have, have another advantage over uh, all the, the, the usual, the traditional dirty tricks, which are inherently competitive and they don't bother me that much because they're inherently competitive. But the point is these companies have another advantage which is they know exactly who is undecided. In other words, who can still be influenced. Exactly. They know down to the, mm -hmm. to, you know, to the shoe size of those people. They know exactly who they are. So they can concentrate, and in a manner that costs them nothing, they can concentrate just on those people. So talk about swing states, swing counties, swing districts. Okay, well, here we're talking about they know who the swing people are. 
So the, the political world, they, they do it all the time, try to identify based on voting histories. But what, what is it, what, what's Google doing to identify? Well, is it, is it ser- looking at all their search? Are they looking at getting everything off their phone to figure it out? What's, uh, how are they doing it? Well, you and I have been using, maybe not Tim because he looks a little bit younger than us, but you and I have been using the internet for 20 years. I've been using it longer than you guys. Okay, that's cool. Late 80s when I was a little kid, Darpa. we had CompuServe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, Box. then, uh, I hate to tell you, but Google alone has more than 3 million pages of information about you. 3 million pages. They're, they're, they're monitoring everything you do, not just if you're stupid enough to use their surveillance email system, which is called gmail or their surveillance browser which is called chrome or their surveillance operating system which is called android these are surveillance systems that's what they are that's the Ch- all the they chinese are, chinese really. couldn't do it better good thing uh but they not only they not only uh are doing that they're actually monitoring us over more than 200 different platforms most of which no one ever heard of mm-hmm. so for example millions of websites uh, around the world use Google Analytics to track traffic to their websites, and it's free, free, free. Of course, nothing's really free. You pay with your freedom. But the point is, Google Analytics is Google, and according to Google's terms of service and privacy policy, which I actually read over and over again and whenever they make changes in it, if you are using any Google entity of any sort that they made, then they have a right to track you. So you are being tracked on all of those websites by Google. Every single thing you do on those websites is being tracked by Google. So uh, I don't need to ask you. I mean, you know about Facebook shadow, shadow profiles. Of course. This is, a, this is an amazing phenomenon. Yeah. I, I explained to people. Are you familiar with shadow profiles? No, but I, I'm sure I see them in my, in my feed. Let right? me just... No, so, no, no, don't, no. You don't okay. see no, you them. Don't. To everybody mm-hmm. who's listening, you have a Facebook profile. And I, I, I love starting this because then... And the, Someone says, no, I don't have a Facebook. Yep. I've no, never I signed up for Facebook. Okay. And here's, here's the really simple version. I'll play that role. Is it a clone, but, but a clone or ghost of no, you? No, 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 no. I'll, give, no. You, I'll, I'll yeah. give the simple version and throw it to Dr. Epstein, Epstein, who knows better than I. But when you sign up for, you're on Facebook, right? Yep. When you sign up, you get a little prompt. Hey, would you like to add your friends and family through your phone book? Simple way they can do this. Your mom does not have a Facebook profile. She's never signed up, but she does have a shadow profile. When you sign up and say, import my, my friends, mm-hmm. it then finds in your phone book, mom, 555-1234. Guess what? Your brother also signs up, mom, 555-1234. What happens then is all those little bits of data, Facebook then sees that and says, we know that mom has these sons. We know from, this, from public data on the phone number, mom's name is Jane Doe. Mm-hmm. Now they've they've compiled whom they have a profile on your mom, her friends, her family, where she works, her salary, all that information from all these ancillary sources. And you probably know better than I do. So I don't know if you want to elaborate. Well, because from that point on, once that has been set up, information continues to flow in and build that profile. So that profile becomes over time immense, just as these all these profiles are immense the shadow profiles are immense as well. So it means that they know who's gonna vote, who's not gonna vote, who's made up their minds, they don't bother with those people, who has not made up their minds. They know exactly who those people are. That gives them an advantage which no campaign manager has ever had in in history because they know exactly who those people are. Now, now, now let me explain. So who's using it? Is is Google using that to influence who they want to influence, or are they selling it to a candidates to do that? No, they're doing it themselves mm-hmm. because they have a very, very strong political culture. Mm-hmm. And so they have their own agenda, which they are trying very hard to spread around the world, and they're impacting right now more than 5 billion people every single day. So they're doing a pretty darn good job. One of the leaks from Google a couple of years ago was an eight minute video called The Selfish Ledger. If you, if you type in, please don't use Google, Google to do this, use the Brave search engine, okay, or anything but, but Google, don't use Google. Uh, type in my name, so Dr. Robert Epstein, and then I type in Selfish Ledger, and you will get to a transcript I made of this eight-minute film that leaked from their, the Advanced Products Division of Google. And this video is extraordinary because this video 
which was never meant to be seen outside the company, is about the ability that Google has to re-engineer humanity. They call it behavioral sequencing. And they do have that ability, and they're exercising that ability. So uh, they have they, they know more about us than we know about ourselves. They even have, for many of us, our DNA data. That's why Google has, for many years now, been investing in, uh, in DNA repositories. Uh, that's why Google helped to set up 23andMe. That was set up by one of the spouses of one of the founders. So the DNA information becomes part of our profiles, in which case they know about the diseases we're likely to get, and they can start to monetize that information long before you even get sick. They also know who, which dads have been cuckolded, by the way. Uh, so, you know, they, they know so, oh now, Fitbit, they own Fitbit, so they're getting physiological data 24 hours a day. They benefited tremendously from COVID, so much so that it kind of makes me wonder whether they had something to do with COVID, but they benefited from COVID because, un, because of COVID and their cooperation with their government in trying to track the spread of COVID, they got access to hospital data for tens of millions of Americans. So they got access to medical records, which they've been after for a long time. COVID gave them that access. They bought the Nest Smart Thermostat Company a few years ago. The first thing they did without telling anyone was put microphones inside of some Nest products. So now they have microphones in people's homes, millions of homes, and they start to get patents. I have copies of them. Patents on method, new methods for analyzing data inside a home so that you can make reasonable inferences about whether the kids are brushing their teeth enough, uh, what the sex life is like, whether there are arguments taking place. All of that, of course, can be monetized, but also it becomes part of our profiles. And that information is used to make predictions about what it is we want, what we're going to do, whether we're going to vote, whether we're undecided, and it gives them more and more power to manipulate. So I'm going to give you a glimpse of one of our newest research projects, data that we just got. So this will be just an, uh, an exclusive for your show. Oh. Okay. And this is called <clears throat> DPE, Digital Personalization Effect. We've, we've been studying the the impact that bias content has on people we've been doing that since whatever it is 2013 but now in the new experiments we've added personalization so we're comparing what happens if we send people biased results or biased content of any sort and we already know the shifts we're going to get that way and now we're personalizing it so based on the way someone answers questions in the beginning we, e we either are or are not sending them content from news sources and talk show hosts and celebrities that they trust. And if they're getting the same content, but it's from trust trusted entities, trusted sources, we that can triple the size of the shift we get in voting preferences. It can triple it. Now this is this is one of our new research areas. It's going to take a long time for us to you know work out all the details, but think about that. These companies are not only sending bias content to you know for to 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 satisfy their agenda for humanity. They're sending personalized content to everybody. Do you know this big trial that's in progress right now? A couple of days ago, a Google executive said under oath, "We don't make use." of the massive amount of information we have about everyone. We don't use it. Well, how are they sending out personalized content to everyone if they're yeah. not using it? So I'm wondering if this algorithmic control, these <clears throat> ephemeral, <clears throat> ephemeral experiences, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know, can they overcome reality, right? Joe Biden does a bad thing. They can try and make that story go.